Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Harin Sanghiran, and here with me is Max Cantor. Um, we are from we are from the data science group at Condé Nast, and today we'll be giving a talk about bring your own container using Docker images in production and how it helps us streamline our processes. So first, some introduction about Condé Nast. So Condé Nast is a global leader in media featuring many iconic brands such as The New Yorker, Wired, Vanity Fair, Epicurious, and many more. Um, some of the examples of machine learning tasks we use here at Condé Nast include content recommendation and audience segmentation. Specifically today, um, we'll be talking about um, our audience segmentation platform called Spire. Spire is a user uh, platform for user segmentation and app targeting, which analyzes over 100 million users on a daily basis. Last year, we also gave a talk about how we scaled um, production machine learning pipeline in Spire for over 1,700 model um, that helps score uh, use over 100 million user every day. And link in this slide is also the link to that talk. So if you're interested. Um, please feel free to go watch it after this one. Um, so as an overview of today's presentation, we will be breaking it into two, three parts. The first part is like the high level overview of the Spire architecture and how, and how um, using Docker container streamlined that process. Next, we'll be going into the detail of how we actually implemented um, Docker Inspire. And last, we'll talk about our learning experience from the process itself. So getting into the high level overview of how Docker streamlines Spire deployment. Um, so from a, from a thousand foot view, um, Spire is essentially just a platform that ingests data from our first, second and third party um, sources. It performs uh, machine learning tasks such as pre-processing, training, scoring, uh, model lifecycle management, for example, um, training score, training each model on a weekly basis and running the latest model or the best model on user on a daily basis. Then one, once we have the score, we output the data into a Delta Lake that gets um, out, um, read by downstream processes um, most of these processes can be categorized into two categories. One is ad targeting, and the second one is content recommendation. And so the way that user will see these, um, the spy output will be either through like more relevant ads for the user or uh, a better recommendation or like recommendation of the content that might be re relevant to that user. So digging down a little deeper, um, Spy contains three, three main components. The first component is called Kalos, which is our modeling library. Kalos handles things like model interface standardization, serialization, versioning and tracking, and hyperparameter tuning. And Kalos is also fully integrated with uh, MLflow and Spark MLlib. Next is more of our more standard um, software application, which is the Spy core library. Um, this component handles the database management, scheduling, and orchestration. And the last component is the data science common library, which, which is just a utility library that we share, about, share with team members of our team. Um, so here you can see the diagram of how we deploy each component of Spy into production without a container. So what so this is what we we're using previously. Each component of Spy will have its own deployment pipeline. And this pipeline mainly in, involves um, two things. One is the quality control, which is done through um, automated testing and code reviews. So when the automat automated testing passes and the code, code got approved, we have an automated deployment system, which um, create a Python wheel and then upload it to DBFS. So 
So as you can see, each of the component of SPI has its own separate wheel, and each wheel will be versioned according to the standard. And then downstream task which uses SPI will pick up these, install these wheel individually, each subcomponent individually um, to perform some tasks. Um, so this, these wheel can be either installed using at a, at a cluster level or also through a, a pip magic in a notebook. So as you can see, the dependency, the arrow here shows the dependency of each task to each wheel. And then this can get um, messy quite quickly since um, the task has the flexibility to choose its own version of Spy and what version of other components in Spy. And it's also difficult to, to be confident that each of the version works together like perfectly. So next is the, the same, pretty much the same use case, but with Docker. So as you can see, the pipeline now looks much cleaner. So the pipeline with Docker first um, start with a Docker file. So what, so in this Docker file, we specify, we use Docker file to specify the image, Docker image, which um, we install each of the component in, inside this image from the straight from the source, so no more wheel. And then once we build we build up this image, this image gets into automated automated testing to make sure that each of the component work together um, correctly. And then once that passes it automatically gets uploaded to a container registry. In this case, we're using GitHub container registry. And then from there, the spy uh, um, downstream task just have to reference one version of the image to, to select which version they want to use. This means that um, they don't have to specify three different things. And also that, this single image is also tested to make sure that the, the three different components work well together. Um, so to, to give some recap about the benefit of using container and how we use container. First, um, we prepackage all of our dependency into a container image where each image re represents a tested combination of the package that is also linked to a specific Databricks runtime and a specific version of Spire. Um, one obvious benefit you can see from the diagram is that we have fewer pipelines to manage. And another benefit is that uh, we have the engineer like me and Max have explicit and upfront control over the dependency version, like the, the, the version of each of the subcomponents. Um, this means that we can um, select the appropriate version for the version of Spy that we want to run, and then um, decided decided be decided and package as as an image, and so when the the uh, end user use uses Spy, they just select from one of of the already um, tested combination that we have already designed. Um, so next, before we go into the implementation detail, I'll give you some of introduction about container, how container works on Databricks. So to use a container on the Databricks, it consists of four uh, main steps. So the first step is to choose a base image. So for the majority of the case, um, the user will be using the standard base image, which is the image that, that you kind of get when you create the default um, Databricks cluster for a notebook job. But if you have like a more specific requirements, there's also a wide variety of image that you can choose from. For example, the minimal image is just the requirements that is needed to start a cluster, but you won't be able to run a notebook for it. So this might be something that is suitable for something like a jar task. Or if you have a machine learning model that requires accelerated um, training, with GPU, then you might start out with a GPU image. And in this slide, I have also linked to the definition, the repository that stores the definition of these images. So if you want to learn more, feel free to dig in to the Docker file there. 
Um, next, after you have built your image, you just have to add dependency that you want to be packaged in that image. So in our case, this normally consists of running pip install the source code of the three components, Kalos, Spy, and data science, that data science common. Additionally, if you have um, Ubuntu binaries that you want to rely on, you can install that as well. Since um, the base image is a, it's based on Ubuntu. Um, and after you have defined your image and built it, the next step is to push it up to a Docker registry. So there are there are two recommended ways to two recommended registry here. One is the AWS ECR, and the second is the Azure Container Registry. But also any any registry that supports basic authentication works as well. So in our case, we have this we have chosen GitHub Container Registry, and with authentication through the basic authentication, because um, due to our constraint, this, this turned out to work the best for us. And so after you have chosen your base image, um, decide what to include in those image and push it up to a container registry, you can now start a cluster with that image. So to do that, if you were using a UI, you would go to the uh, create cluster UI, UI, and then there would be a box, a uh, check check box, um, saying that you want to start the cluster with your own Docker container. Once you have clicked that check box, there will be an option for you to um, put in the URL of your container and then the authentication that you would like to use, and then you're done. You you have a cluster uh, preload with everything you need. No more fiddling with the libraries in, at a cluster level or at a notebook level. Um, so next, Max will give you um, the details of how we implement the Docker with Inspire and the learning that we came out with. Max? Thanks, Haran. Yeah, so now that we've discussed the basics of Spire and of containerization on Databricks, I'll talk about some of the more specifics um, in our use case. So we used Databricks Minimal as our base image and uh, using Ubuntu 18.04. And then in our case, we actually created our image before DBR7X functionality had been included in the Databricks base images. So we created custom DBR7X functionality building on top of Databricks Minimal. In addition to that base image, we also then include the Spire package itself, as well as the aforementioned sub packages like Kalos and DataSci Commons. And then we also include all of the dependencies for all of these packages via their uh, requirements, uh, requirements.txt files. And then as Fran also already said, we host these on GitHub packages, GHCR. We have two primary packages, the uh, production package, which is Spire, and the development package, which is Spire Dev. However, in each case, we can host multiple images per package. So in the case of production, for instance, we'll have a, a tag for uh, latest, one for stable, uh, stable being usually what we've uh, actually have in deployment, and then any number of older versions as well. And then likewise, we can uh, push manually built development packages. These could be features that we're not ready to deploy yet, but still want to be able to use in some out of band fashion. Uh, they can also just be for the purposes of development. But these are tied into the GitHub release tags or the version number for the package. So it's a, a very streamlined process. And it also integrates really well with our CI CD pipeline. We use GitHub Actions CI CD. And uh, in, in our case, when you push a commit, um, such as to like a, a, a PR, for instance, it will go through our PyTest suite where it will run the tests on Ubuntu as well as Mac. In the case of Mac, it's going to be running the PyTest from a clean environment, but as if it were a uh, local development. However, for Ubuntu, it's going to use Docker Compose to actually run the tests through 
the uh, Docker image itself or through the Docker container itself. And then in the case of release tags, it automates the build and deploy process of the Docker image containing Spire and all the dependencies and submodules and so on, which can then be passed to uh, a Databricks job or to our Airflow deployments in production. Now I'll discuss the various pros and cons, the things that we've learned over the course of this development. One thing I, I'd like to state up front is that while we do list some cons, the pros far outweigh the cons. This has been a, a really great, um, you know, advantageous feature for us. And in many cases, these cons are things that we anticipate we'll be able to solve over time. And especially we have good communication with Databricks and they're uh, often working with us to add new features. So I, I do want to state that up front, but I still think it's important that we, we discuss some of the uh, learning curves in addition to all the benefits. So first, uh, the pro, the, the most obvious one, of course, it being containerization is just the degree to which it automates and simplifies our control over the module itself and all of the dependencies. Um, again, you know, things like Kalos, Statusi Commons, our requirements.txt files with all of our, our PIP packages, all of these kinds of things. It's, it's much more streamlined as, as Heron showed. Uh, it also has, as we've said, fluid integration with our existing deployment pipeline. So I mentioned the GitHub Actions CI CD and the, the PyTest integration and the multiple OS support and the release tagging. Uh, but also on top of all that, it, it even gives us a uh, test database integration as well. So we have integrations tests within our PyTest suite, which use a Postgres database and we're able to create a Docker volume, which we can uh, tear up and tear down. And that allows us to create a clean working environment from which to test the actual database connections and, and data flow via that. So it's, it's very streamlined. And additionally, uh, we can not only use those images for the purposes of our, our Airflow deployments and production, but we can also have Databricks jobs which through their graphical user interface can very easily be um, pointed to different images for uh, processes that maybe are for business or logistical reasons, things that were not necessarily ready to uh, you know, enter into our, our uh, stable code base or into our, our production deployment, but are still things in an out of band way we wanna be able to run sooner than later. So in that regard, um, we can have Databricks jobs and our main deployments uh, concurrently in a matter that is as uh, that has as high verisimilitude as possible, where maybe the only major difference is just some feature that we need for that Databricks job. There's also ease of debugging. So for instance, when you create your container and have your image locally, you can do those uh, PyTests through Docker Compose and then use uh, PDB set traces and just trace through your test framework, again, with that Docker volume for even the integrations test, and do that literally just as easily as if it were in your, your local environment per se. Uh, and on top of that, you can even SSH into the container itself and see specifically what is inside that container outside of just the PyTest development context. So it, it really is, I, I can't stress enough, just as easy, if not easier, than local development. There's none of that obfuscation you sometimes get when you add these new tools into your uh, uh, production, um, or sorry, your development process. Uh, so now I'll, I'll move on to some of the cons. And, and again, with the, the caveat that um, the pros far outweigh the cons, but I'll, I'll go through these as well. So one is DBR version and compatibility. So for instance, right now, DBR 8X is not supported, only six and seven. And when we created our image, it was uh, with 7X, but this was before 7X was supported. So we had to create our own custom base image. And in general, it's likely the case that as you're developing over time, uh, whether it's to manage various sub, uh, sub modules or other dependencies, it's, it's likely that you'll need to do your own um, custom work on that, that image. There's also uh, some PIP package management involved and matching between the runtime specifications and what you have in your, your, um, your image. So for instance, there was a point where 
we were mostly on 7x, but still had a few tasks that required 6x clusters. And uh, some of the differences between 6 and 7x, such as, for instance, the different versions of, of Spark, then required different versions of other packages. And so we had to have uh, separate requirements and separate images um, for these processes. And you know, ultimately, it's still much easier that way than having to do all of these things ad hoc, but it is something that you need to keep in mind. Also, these image sizes can get very large. If you're used to using Docker images for the sake of uh, deployment processes, you, you, you might have your images be somewhere in the range of 100 to 500 megabytes. But in the case of the Databricks runtime, that's going to make the image much larger. As you can see here, the Databricks runtime standard is 1.84 gigabytes. And uh, in our case, when you include Spire and you include the submodules and dependencies and so on, it ends up being over two gigabytes per image. So it is worth keeping in mind that these are, are rather large. And on top of that, it does require prior Docker experience to customize the image, to be aware of those local memory constraints. Um, there are also cases where, again, if you're doing development with these images, Docker sometimes caches certain things. It, it can um, cache different dependencies. It can cache environment variables. And it's not always clear uh, where and why and how. So oftentimes, you need to be doing pruning of your containers and images. Um, and all of this, every time you have to rebuild the image or push the image or pull the image, all of these things um, are, there's a lot of data involved in it. it. It can slow down your deployment pipeline and your deployment process. Mm -hmm. So it is worth keeping that in mind that if, if you're trying to do, you know, very like rapid fire deployments, this is, is going to slow you down a little bit. That being said, I think that the advantages that you gain uh, from how this streamlines the overall development process far outweigh those, uh, those slowdowns, but it is worth keeping in mind. And then, so this won't be the case if you're using uh, Azure Container Registry or AWS ECR. Um, in our case, it made the most sense to use GHCR. Uh, but one side effect of that and the fact that it uses basic auth is that in Databricks, it's being stored in plain text, as you can see here, uh, with the username and password. Uh, so hopefully there's no one on your, your uh, Databricks cloud that shouldn't have access to this anyway. But it is a thing to, to be mindful of that this is in plain text. So that could be a potential security issue. And each usage of the image requires a pull of the container. So when you're uh, deploying your, or when you're pushing your commits and it's integrating this into the CI CD, or in our case, our, our Airflow task end up launching these clusters or the Databricks jobs. And so you can see, for instance, here with the uh, Spire 3.3.1, uh, just in a span of, of two months, there was over 200,000 pulls. So this can grow quickly. Uh, this is a lot of data. Now, there are ways to do cluster pools and maybe keeping your clusters warmed. And there, there, there may even be ways to cache this. This is something where I think we're going to need to talk to Databricks and, and see what our options are. Uh, but at least at the moment, this is the case for us. So it is worth keeping in mind that this is a, a lot of data involved in the um, pushing and pulling of these images. But really, with all of that being said, I, I want to stress again that the pros far outweigh the cons. This has greatly streamlined our dependency management, our package management. It's integrated really well into our CI CD. Um, it's given us uh, predictable runtime behavior, even between both our uh, production deployment and our various Databricks jobs. It's uh, you know seamless with our testing. So all of this has been really wonderful, and it's it's impressive that we're able to do this kind of containerization with Databricks. Uh, but you know it is worth considering that there are still going to be dependency synchronization issues potentially. Uh, you could have basic auth security concerns if you're using GHCR or something besides the recommended approaches. There's overhead with Docker and um, the image sizes. So all of these things are, are things that you should keep in mind. But uh, I, I think this is a worthwhile approach to um, running your production pipelines. So that's our presentation. Thank you very much.